direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. Okay. Time for another show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Kenny will complain that you can see the green screen stands in the background. Everything kind of fell apart this morning. And yet here we are. And this is, by the way, the way the hair looked when I woke up. I thought to myself, oh, I should wash my hair. And they said, oh, it looks good enough. Anyway, welcome to the show. This is Billy Masters Live. And of course, I am Billy Masters. And today is Thursday, June 18th, 2020. We are at show... I, I have to look. What show is this? I think it's like, oh, it's right up there. See, I can't see because the camera's in the way. 24. This is 12 weeks into quarantine. Is that possible? I think I skipped the first two weeks. Um, I had had surgery. I was busy. I was sleeping. And I was on drugs. Um, and But we're still here. And uh, typically, I begin the show with... Um, a personal anecdote, but I'm going to have a lot of anecdotes with our first guest because I've known him forever and we kind of love a lot of the same people. So uh, before we get to the show, let me just uh, give you an update, which is next Tuesday may be a special show. It may not be a special show. I'm waiting for someone to get back to me. So it may be a really special show. So you're going to have to tune in just on the off chance that it's a really good show. Um, Thursday show, however, is a very good show because we are going to have back one of our favorite people, Frank DeCaro, talking about his book about the history of drag. And we've got Oh, wait, we've got at least two of the most fabulous drag queens out there. We have Alaska Thunderfuck. I'm not even a lot sure if I can say that, but I'm saying it. And uh, the premier share impersonator, Chad Michaels. There you go. I almost said, I'm not going to say it, but there's another Chad that I'm really close friends with. And I almost said him. And he'll be sitting there saying, I don't do share. Um, reminder that we are still uh, in search of a social media assistant. I need all the help I can get. And if you're watching this on Facebook, Get off Facebook. Facebook is fabulous, but the live feeds are not great. And everyone tells me that they can see the show much better on YouTube. So there's a link on my Facebook page to go to YouTube. And when you're at YouTube, I'll wait. Don't worry. You've got time. I'm not saying anything. If you go to YouTube right there, like in that corner, there's a little button with my logo that says subscribe. It costs you nothing. And it gives us I really don't know what it gives us, but I'm supposed to tell you to subscribe. This is why I need help. Anyway, uh, our this is an all-Broadway show, which should have been last Thursday because it was on Tony's Eve, which was there were no Tonys. So we're late. Um, but our first guest is a good friend of mine. I've known him for years. Um, as many of you know, I... I'm a moving target. I'm usually in one of three different places, either in Boston, in Los Angeles, or in Florida. What, which really makes, you know, it sounds so fabulous. Oh, you've got three homes and you're able to play, go places. What it means is, is you need three of your favorite things. Because sometimes you're like, oh, I'd like to wear that shirt. This wasn't the shirt I wanted to wear, by the way. The shirt I wanted to wear had some green in it. And then it was the green a whole technical thing that only me and Dan rather understand. But one of the things in all three of my homes is this book, this book called Nothing Like a Dame. I have three copies of this because sometimes in the middle of the night, I want to read a chapter. I didn't pay for any of the three books, but I have three copies of the book. I didn't have them autographed because I thought it might diminish the sale price if I go to sell them on eBay when times get tough, which are certainly happening. Um, and it's a book that I've known about since, like it was a germ of an idea in the um, head of the author. And I followed the um, travails of this book all through its publication. I couldn't be prouder of it, just like I couldn't be prouder or more fond of its author, Mr. Eddie Shapiro. Hold on, let's get him up here. Hey, Eddie. Hello. That was that oh, was wait. quite the intro. I mean, my, my mother wouldn't have done as good of an intro. 
And she doesn't have three copies. Your mother might have paid for the book. She didn't. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, we're having a little bit of a delay, so hopefully you can uh, bear with it. Um, but you look fabulous. Where in, in mauve? Is that mauve that you're no, wearing? It's light blue, but you know, I'll take mauve, sure. I mean, you know, in the light, whatever. And you as well. Right, fine. Where are you? Which of your two homes? I'm in West Hollywood right now. Um, I was actually due to fly back to New York on March 13th. And on March 12th, I was like, mm, maybe not. Um, and I have to confess um, <laughs> on topic that uh, the, the, the camel breaking straw was when they announced that Broadway was closed. And I had tickets for nine shows <laughs> lined up the following week. And I was like, well, then there's no point in going. <laughs> um, and the only reason I know the date is because as a people who've been watching the show on March 12th, I had rotator cuff surgery, which is why I was in Boston. And then March 13th, they said all non-life threatening essential surgeries are canceled. So I got under the wire under and the ended wire. up and ended up stuck here in Boston, which is so delightful. Well, you probably also wanted to keep March 12th clear to celebrate Liza Minnelli's birthday. You know, so, you know, I keep telling you, it's a funny thing that you bring that up because this is my third shoulder replacement surgery or soldier uh, uh, rotator cuff surgery. And um, people are like, you only have two shoulders. I'm like, Liza Minnelli has had three hip replacement surgeries and she's only got two hips that we know. I, I, I'm not sure she only has two hips, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, I think there might be one in the jar under her bed. Um, so... I love this book. It is one of those books that when I first got it, I'm showing it. Oh, wait, I've got a, I've got an image and everything here that people could see it better. Ooh. Hold on. Hold on. There it is. Right between us. Oh. Nothing like a dame, Eddie Shapiro. And um, the, the book can be enjoyed on so many different levels. When I first got it, I read it start to finish. Now I use it sort of as a reference book. Whenever I uh, see a musical, I want to read about the origins of that musical or people who performed to that musical before. Or if I see somebody perform, there's a pretty exhaustive catalog of legendary uh, female performers in Broadway musicals here. And um, did you anticipate it would be a reference book or did you just think it would be like a coffee table celebration of these women? Um. I thought I, I anticipated it as a reference book when my publisher sort of Oxford um, brought that up as just a selling point that, you know, that, wow. that could be used as that. But when I first envisioned it, the actual idea came from um, watching Barbara Cook in concert. Somebody I know you've seen in concert a zillion times, although you've seen everybody in concert a zillion <laughs> times. Um, yes. But Barbara Cook in her patter between songs would talk about the golden age of Broadway musicals, and she would talk about working with the likes of Oscar Hammerstein and Julie Stein and Leonard Bernstein, a bunch of Stein. <laughs> um, uh, but she, uh, I would look at her and think, gosh, you know, this is a, th th her stories are so rich and they are um, a, a link to the golden age and she wasn't getting any younger. And uh, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to try to capture some of these stories while this living link is still around? So I wrote her this impassioned letter and said, you know, would you, would you be interested in working on your autobiography? And she wrote back a very lovely, no. <laughs> but um, Then I was having lunch with a good friend of mine on 57th street. Um, and she said, well, why stop at Barbara Cook? And I thought, mm -hmm. yeah, why stop at Barbara Cook? So I wrote to her again and I said, what if you were just a chapter in a book about, other women. And to that, she said, yes. And, and once I had Barbara Cook on board, then I went after all the others. Of course, the great irony is that by the time I was ready to publish, Barbara Cook had decided to, in fact, write her own autobiography and asked me to withhold the chapter, which I did. But um, I still have it. And I'm thinking about you <laughs> in, a, in a next volume. So... You know, I'm gonna. Uh, I just want to bring up what's an interesting trajectory, and we had I had talked about this in a previous show. One of my dearest friends was Rick McKay, who was a documentary filmmaker, and he had started 
uh, sort of the same way as you is that he was friends with uh, certainly with Barbara Cook, who was one of his best friends. But um, many people who he'd hear stories from who would say he'd think to himself, when these people are gone, we are going to lose their stories. And he worked with um, uh, the local PBS affiliate in New York doing little short pieces on these performers. You know, he did a famous thing about Elaine Stritch before the documentary about her came out, which then ended up becoming his documentary, Broadway, The Golden Age, which really was very similar to yours um, in that, you know, his was an audiovisual um chronicling of a bygone era, whereas yours is much more in depth. I think in the written word, you kind of give the um, performer a little bit more freedom and latitude to go into their stories where video, it's so linear, you have to compress it into a short well, you it's know, too, period of time. he also, he went thematic. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I love, love, love his documentary. And I'm so mm-hmm. sad that, you know, the, his, his, he, he passed before he could finish his follow-up um, uh, pieces. The but, two, yep. Yeah. Um, he went sort of in themes. My goal in Nothing Like a Dame, um, and one of the things that that I really wanted to achieve, yes, there it is, thank you. I got one too. <laughs> um, uh, uh, one of the things that I wanted to achieve was I read so, as I'm sure you did, um, so many articles in newspapers and in Playbill Magazine and profiles of these people that would give quotes here and there, but there were there were tasting nuggets. There was never enough for me. So I wanted to do um, career encompassing interviews with these people and talk about literally every musical that they did, as well as, as, you know, sort of their upbringing and what inspired them and how they got into the business. Um, So in some cases that meant I would sit with people. I mean, Patty Lapone and I spent 10 and a half hours, um, Mm -hmm. crazy amounts of time. And then of course, editing these conversations down was a massive task. Um, right. But I mean, what a what fun to be ten and a half hours of Patty Lapone, right? Um, yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't think you even know this. I just finished the follow up, um, which is a book on the men. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yes. I was always wondering, you know, uh, where you could go with this because this focuses on women from musical theater, and I also thought you could do women of legitimate theater. Yeah. Men of musical theater. I mean, there is a whole range of of uh, books you can do. Child actors who work with dogs. I mean, we could go the exactly. the life. whole all of the Annies. You yeah. know, the Brisbois, the Sarah, all of them. Jelly Bruce. Do you, yeah. do you like that the first name I came up with was Brisbois? Um, I would expect nothing less. Thank you. Well, you know, I love my Daniel. Um, I want to ask you. You know, you put th- these women all to my reading as a fan. It really delineated them into three kind of categories. There were the larger than life people who really brought their personality to the shows they in, inhabited. Then there were the ones who really disappeared in roles and you knew their names, but like it wasn't a, a um, I'm trying to think of who a Victoria Clark is a perfect example. It never became a Victoria Clark show. She was really digging into it from an acting standpoint. And then you had the people who fell in the middle, kind of like a Patty Lupone, who was a force of nature, but also really dug into the acting. Oh, and in the first category, I should say you have the Carol Channing type. So yeah. um, did you know? that you were going to end up with three different kinds of approaches to this? Or did that just come up while you were putting the book together? No, that, that I mean, there are lots of things I see. I still would not have even thought of it in those terms. Oh, wow. uh, uh, that The ones that you did, I think, I mean, I have my own sort of categorizations of the way I categorize them, but it's, it's, it's completely subjective. Um, and, right. and I think an open for, for the readers, what I love about this book though, is that, well, I love many things about the book. Obviously I wouldn't have done it, but, <laughs> uh, but, uh, there are people like Carol Channing and Angela Lansbury, whose lives have been documented. Although I, I still felt very, um, excited, uh, to be bringing out stories that I had never read or seen before um, and, and getting pieces from them that were sort of new, at least to me. And I had done a lot of research as to what they had told the, the press and the media before. But then um, there are also lots of people, like you say, Victoria Clark or Judy Kay or Karen Ziemba, who are great 
great Broadway performers, but the opportunity to to read the kind of thing that they say in the book is much harder to come by. Their their sure. stories are told nearly as often. So I was really happy to sort of have the 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 household names along with the 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 real working actors. Um, and all of them are Tony Award winners. Well, was that was that part of the criteria that they had to be Tony Award winners? That was part of the criteria. And really, that criteria was only created because I needed a net of some kind. Um, there are so many great women. Right. Um, I would have liked to have included. So I thought, okay, how do I narrow this field down? Because uh, the book had to be... For, for the size chapter that I wanted, I wanted, as I said, career encompassing chapters for it to be um, uh, big chapters and not be the size of a phone book, uh, sure. I had to limit it to 20 women. So there was criteria. Can I ask who would, if you could have added one person to the book, who would you have added? Um, I mean, I mean, you could say, I'll give you two different scenarios. One, just a personal choice and one that you would have added, but they didn't win a Tony. Uh, well, the latter is easy, and the latter is the one I took the most crap for, um, and that's Kelly O'Hara. Um, she mm -hmm. hadn't won a Tony yet, um, and a lot of people were, how could you not include Kelly O'Hara? And at the time, right. she didn't fit the criteria. Um, uh, in terms of who I would have and, and would have loved to have, there are a couple who passed. There are a couple who I, you know, Bernadette Peters is not in this book. Um, and I did like 85 rounds with her. I courted her. I sent her gourmet dog biscuits. I, <laughs> I stalked the woman. Um, I got friends. I got her dresser after her. I mean, I was really tenacious. Um, did she have a reason? Uh, yeah, she did. Um, and she, in fact, did say yes to it ultimately. And then literally the week before we were supposed to meet, she, she backed out. She apparently um, is not a big fan of talking about herself. Oh. So if I were talking about dogs, she said, I would be more than happy to spend hours with you talking about animal rescue. But mm -hmm. reflecting on me isn't, you know, that's not what, what she just felt not fully comfortable with that. And of course I had to respect that. And then there were other- yeah, You don't have to. <laughs> well, um, I choose to for the purposes of I'm um, hoping to land her. <laughs> um, but there were others who, um, uh, you know, I mean, of course, you know, there there are several who passed who I really wanted, and one who I even spoke to about doing this. I did talk to Marin Maisie about doing this um, before I had sort of decided that they had to win a Tony, but I still had her in mind for the next volume and. Obviously, that's an opportunity that's escaped me. Um, uh, you know, you said something a minute ago, which really struck me. Um, I do a lot of research for each of these shows. And one of the reasons I do it is, be, is because I don't want the person I'm interviewing telling the same story that yeah. I've heard a million times. And some of the people in this book, I have found that not only do they, there are some stories they have to tell, but there are some stories that they have rehearsed so well that they use the same phrasing every time they say it. If Patti LuPone once more uses the term batting practice, I may lose my mind. You can watch Carol Channing. You can go on YouTube yeah. and, five ca and find videos of Carol Channing telling the story of when she first went into the William Morris Agency 20 years apart, and they are verbatim word for yeah. word. And uh, and that's actually the example I was going to use because I had done one of the last interviews with Carol Channing. Um, she had come to Provincetown to perform with Tommy, Tommy Toon. And um, the quotes were virtually identical. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you. Right, right, right. What, yeah. I, you have had the experience of being interviewed by the press, as have I. Yeah. Uh, and when you are asked, especially like being on book tour, so you're doing interviews, you know, in a concentrated amount of time and you're frequently asked the same question. Mm -hmm. So when you've already formulated an answer in your mind, it does come fairly quickly out the same way. I have found myself guilty of yeah. you know, not having rehearsed it, but I'm like, well, that's the answer to the question. I already know it. So well, and and if you're like us and you're trying to be entertaining and get a laugh and you know it gets a laugh, right. 
You right. say it. I mean, that there's right. no way around that. So um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you, you know, I had broken them into three different categories. So I'm going to ask you about three different people. And I'm tying it in because usually I do an anecdote and a photo. So these are photos of me, but okay. they're stories for you. I hope so, they're photos with you and Elaine Stritch. That would make me Oh, happy. there's not. I'm sorry. Can, all right. So, but I will say Elaine Stritch refused to take a photo with me because she had curlers on. <laughs> well, you, know, you can't blame her. Elaine Stritch, no. I would lay, she was one. She would say things to me during the interview, like, "Eddie, what the fuck kind of question is that? That's fifty years ago. How the hell am I supposed to remember?" And uh, you kept that. That you kept those asides in the book. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because you were getting a flavor of exactly who she was. You know, it wasn't. It's not just about the data. It's about who are these people. Um, but the the best thing, and I didn't put this in the book because it would have been a little bit too um, self aggrandizing. Um, but she came around to me, I think, after she found out that I was no softy and she realized that I knew my stuff. So she called me after we had done our, our interview to tell me a story. Um, and we had this great conversation. And she said, Eddie, I got to tell you something. I'm so bored talking about the past all the time. But when I talk to you, you have just such a genuine love and enthusiasm about this stuff that... When I think of a story, I get excited to tell you because I know how excited you're going to be. Oh, well, that's and great. I, I was so lovely and I was so happy to have it on tape because in my dark moments, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I can at least play that. As I, was, I, I remember I, in that chapter, there was, I don't remember what the question was, but there was a question you asked her and she made you defend the question and justify the question and then said, well, when you put it that way and then did answer it. So uh, she was the most, I believe, challenging interview in terms of challenging your questions. She was super challenging. I'll tell you one other that was challenging that didn't actually run in the book. And again, maybe in the second volume, but I, I did interview Christine Ebersole. Um, oh, and, wow. and she was, um, you know, you, you think of her as so sort of bubbly, um, but she was um, a little... She, she just isn't somebody who expanded upon her answers. Mm -hmm. You know, she would give sort of brief answers. And by the way, I had that experience. It was really interesting. And the next book with Len Cariou, um, who, Really? And it's not, it's not that he's um, holding back. He just struck me as not especially reflective. Mm -hmm. So you'd ask him a question. And he'd say, yeah, that was great. And stop. You know? <laughs> but he wasn't really digging deep. And I don't think it's because, you know, he's not thoughtful and he wasn't holding back. He just, that's all he had to say about it, you know? Well, I found doing these shows and doing them live in particular, I will have friends that will call you, call me right after the show and go, boy, you had to work for that one. Because right. some people, you know, I, I have had all all different ways of answering. There are people who don't shut up that you want to shut up. There are people who are right down the middle who give you exactly what you want. And then there are people who you ask a five minute question to and they say yes and not. And yeah. well, you want to kill yourself. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Donna Murphy in this book, like all you have to do is say hello. And she's on a monologue. <laughs> um, and, and God love her. She remembers every detail. I mean, she's. Wow and say, I, we were driving down 84th Street on a Thursday, wait, Tuesday, <laughs> and, you know, and she just goes, and I, and, but it's really interesting, as I say in the introduction to her chapter, it's that level of specificity and detail that she also brings to the work, and that's what makes her so genius at the work, because it's just that detail-oriented, but we're getting off, because you have questions about specific- That's okay, that's wanna... okay. Look, again, <laughs> I have learned these shows kind of go where they want to go. Levi is sitting there, look, he's answering emails. He's got better things to do. Oh, I'm, that's I'm, right, I'm, Levi, I'm... we're not coming to you. Keep typing, keep typing. <laughs> All right. See, I love that I have a little eye into, right. into his life. Um, so I'm gonna start with Carol Channing, and uh, this photo, and I told this story before, Carol Channing had come to Provincetown to do a Q and A with Tommy Toon. It was her second to last performance, the last one being in San Francisco, and they they were going to tour with them. It just didn't logistically didn't work out. And uh, you, I don't remember if you were with me, but I know we've talked about this incident with um, Carol years earlier at the El Portal Theater, where oh. she was a hunched over little old woman who yes. I said, "Oh, geez, how is she going to get on stage?" And so gingerly placed in a chair, and then 
dragged over to a curtain. And the minute she was kind of shoved on stage and the light hit her, she sprung to life. Yep. And then the minute the light was off of her, she was that little woman again. Yep. And um, so at this last performance I saw in Provincetown, I had gone with Marilyn May, who isn't much younger than Carol Janik. And, uh, but Ka Marilyn is full of life. And we went over to... Carol, who couldn't really see until you got very close. And we took this photo, which of course I, I adore just because of the history of it. And um, what struck me when I interviewed Carol Channing was she told me that she only played roles that she identified with, that she felt like that girl from Little Rock or felt like Dolly. Was she... Did she bring herself to each of her roles? Could she have played a role, the complete antithesis of who she was? Was she that type of actress? Oh, boy. Um, I think she thought she was. Um, which, well, um, you know, we actually had a conversation about the character of Carol Channing. Um, mm -hmm. She, if she understands herself as being the character of Carol, she doesn't, she doesn't own it. She talked about her performance as Dolly uh, as being very much, you know, I'm invested in, in Dolly Levi and everything Dolly Lee and, and sort of not, not sort of getting what we seem to think, which is this caricature of Carol Channing. Right. Um, uh, but that's not to say that she couldn't act because she absolutely could. Um, it's just sometimes hard to tell where to, to separate, sort of like Dolly Parton, you know? It's like right. this strong, strong character that we all know as Dolly Parton, and then there's Dolly Parton the actor, and we, and it, it's, and the Dolly Parton the real person is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think Carol Channing had crafted her persona so strongly that I, whether it's her doing or our doing, it's hard to see her disappear in that role that she's yeah. playing. Um, I'll tell you a quick story, it, though, about, about please, Carol that is my, uh, it is one of my cherished forever life memories. Um, uh, I had the exact experience with her. I interviewed her separate from the book at Gay Days at Disneyland. Um, uh, was that the picture in the teacup? Yes, that's the picture in the teacup. <laughs> but, um, but I had, I had, so I, I interviewed her at Gay Days and exactly as you said, you know, backstage, she was sort of quiet and small and then the light hits and bam, Dr. Broadway. And here she is. Right. Uh, but the, the following day, um, I spent the day with she and her husband, Harry mm -hmm. at Disneyland. And I'm thinking, you know, he, she was 89 at the time, a mere 89, and he was 90. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, these people are frail. This is Disneyland. It's like Times Square. People are everywhere. One little right. job. And, you're, you know, it could be really, really bad. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking we're going to have a nice leisurely stroll. Nothing doing. They wanted to do everything. Really? So we end up, so at one point, we get off of the Peter Pan ride. And... <laughs> Harry, her husband, is staring at the carousel. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I know, you're laughing, just thinking about them on the Peter Pan. Because I, mean, I we bump, we bump into the Mad Hatter and Alice and, and, and Alice, and there she is with the jam tomorrow, jam yesterday. <laughs> you were at Disneyland just walking by. There's Carol <laughs> Chan. Weird shit. But, uh, but so he's, he's staring at the merry-go-round, and I say, I, you know, I wasn't planning on putting them on the merry-go-round. It's a merry-go-round. But... No. He, he's look. He's staring, and I say, "Harry, did you want to ride the merry-go-round?" And he says, "I'm looking at it." And I say, "Well, Harry, if you want to ride, we'll ride." So we go over to the merry-go-round. I'm thinking they're gonna take a bench. He wants a horse. Oh, but the he's ninety, so yeah. he can't get up on a horse. He literally, you know, puts one leg in a stirrup, and then I get <laughs> underneath him and physically lift him onto the horse. Uh, but he was so, so, so happy. And the two of them were so full of this joy and, and magic at being there. And by the way, the last time Carol Channing had been at Disneyland, she was there with Walt Disney. Oh, and God. She brought the picture to prove it. She, Walt, and Marie Chevalier on Main Street. But, um, but when I think of Walt, I think of Marie Chevalier right? and Carol Channing. Um, but uh, so after that, they were, he would call me literally like, 
um, week to tell me to how, what joy they had. He, the, I, he invited me to be there. I spent the weekend at their house after that and because they were so grateful. And I was reminded at that time, and it's uh, my, 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 my mother was actually, um, she had just attempted suicide because she was oh. so depressed about her, her, her own aging issues. And um, she's fine now, by the way. Uh, but, but I sort of had the balance of, oh, right. There are people who, as they age, can choose to grab every ounce and to right. squeeze the juice out of it. And here they were as such an example. And I thought, Christ, if I get to be that, if I get to be this old, may I remember this lesson? Yeah, make that choice. Live as much as possible because it is a choice. And it was really inspiring to me. Um, I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum. And... Uh, now, here I am with, you know, I'm always with Marilyn May. Let me just point that out, right, apparently. Right. Um, it's, you know, you rarely see the two of us separated. I don't well, know if we are conjoined twins. You've been seen in the same room, so we know you're not yeah. the same person. Right, but we could tour in Sideshow if anyone would like us to. Um, anyway, so then now we have Marilyn May and Victoria Clark. Yes. Now, Victoria Clark is not a recognizable name to most people if you just say the name, but has worked consistently and very thoughtfully and always it seems to me an actor first who happens to be able to sing. Um, did she strike you as more of a craftsperson, more of a journeyman actor? Craftsperson, yes. Victoria Clark loves the art of it. Yeah. So she also teaches and she also directs. Um, and she, so she's very committed to the storytelling elements. She's absolutely um, a craftsperson first. Um, and she takes it very, very seriously. But she's also, um, I was going to use the word laid back. That's not exactly what I mean. But there's unpretentious. A, yeah, there's a comfort in yeah. her. Uh, a sort of um, yes. There's no pretense. It's Absolutely. all, um, which is you know, lovely and what you expect in most stage and many stage actors. Yeah, I I well, I don't know if it's what I would expect from a star, which I think right. is the is interesting in your book. There are stars who are name above title, you know what you're getting, stars. And then there are people who you say, I love them and they always deliver, which is a little different. There is, you know, it, it, but, it's very discernible. But Patti Lapone, as I, as I mentioned in the book, you walk into yeah. Patti Lapone's home and uh, I was surprised that there, you know, I've been, I was both in her Connecticut house and her North Carolina house. And she made you bread. She made me bread, but she also... <laughs> No, no, she, all of the stuff of her career, posters and and awards and photographs of her on stage, none of that in the house. It's all- They're in the, in the basement. It's a basement in the bar. But so it's not like she threw it away, but it's not yeah. like she needs to walk around the house and look at images of herself on stage or see her awards prominently displayed. Nothing, in fact, in the house gives away that an actor lives there. Um, and that was actually my third uh, photo. This was at the, you know, I went to, uh, it, I've only gotten to experience this once, and it was with Patti Lupone. I went to Chicago to see Gypsy at the Ravinia Festival, thinking this is the only time we're going to get to see her do Gypsy because Arthur Lawrence didn't have the rights to control casting off of Broadway. So she got to do it. Yay. Then all of a sudden she's working with him and it goes to city center encores. You think, okay, great. I'm going to get to see it it's kind of staged. Thank God. You don't want to miss it. This could be the only time. And then oh, we're on Broadway all of a sudden. So this photo was from the Broadway production. This was opening night. Lovely. And what struck me about Patty I should have left that up longer. Cause that's a good picture of me, but, what struck me about Patty seeing this growth from concert, you know, kind of stage, but really concert, to pretty semi stage to a full production was how the character grew. And it really made me 
appreciate her the way she wants to be appreciated, which is as an actor. And yet, up until then, I always kind of considered her as a presence, which again, I think there's a difference, but she really won me over as an actress. Um, do you think, so you also have a huge personality and yeah. don't you think that perhaps there are people who discount you as a thinker because they think of you more as a character? Oh, I, absolutely. And I think we all, on Tuesday show, we had Thomas Roberts and Steve Kometko, who both as uh, presenters on television at their prime were extraordinarily beautiful. And so I actually asked them, how did that help them? And what was more interesting was how it hurt them, yes, that right. they weren't taken seriously. They, they were just kind of dismissed as a himbo and whatever. So, yes, I, I have... I. I certainly, I think Patty's voice and the offstage life that we read about very often overshadows the work. And seeing it in three different productions of the same play in different settings kind of stripped that away and really right. got me to say, wow, yeah, she's got but, the goods. And people forget she's a Juilliard trained actor in the under in John Hausman. Yeah, so it's it's she she certainly has the goods, um, and I think our impressions of her have everything to do with you know our assumptions of of what it means to be a brassy belter, you know, which and is not the role she has played, which I think sometimes it's hard to separate, no, you know, I like in Carol Channing, we consider her to be Dolly. But I think people, Patty has complained very often that people saw her as Evita. Yeah, but so Avita's not Avita's a role with some depth to it, and certainly, yeah. you know, she was also doing her fair share of 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 plays, particularly mammut plays. Um, yeah. So if we're paying attention. Uh, there's there's stuff, but outside of New York, you know, not everybody gets to see that. So, did you do you find her to be? You know, she and well, certainly she and Victoria had very happy personal lives, uh, very stable marriages, which I think really um, gave them that sort of, if your home life is in order, you can then, you don't need as much from the work. Work is what you do. It's not your life. Hmm. Um, I can't, I can't opine as to whether or not it's their home life that gave them that. But certainly Patty said in so many words, when I asked her about the lack of sort of Broadway accoutrement around her house, she said, oh, I leave it at the stage door. I, you know, I'm fiercely devoted to the work, but when I step over the, that threshold, that's work. Um, and that that was an interesting approach. Um, mm. uh, I mean, I think that there are people yeah, I don't know. I think of, I, I, there are plenty of single people I know who are not solely committed to the work or people who don't necessarily have the happy home life. So mm -hmm. I don't know that that correlation, but it's, it's hard to say. Of course, right now, happy home life is defined as a whole other thing. I've talked to so many people, right. these Tony Award winning people who are saying things like, I don't know if I'm ever going to work again. Right. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I think Patty was one of the first people to talk about when they were saying, oh, we're going to open in the middle of the summer. Oh, we're going to open up in the fall. Patty was like, we're not open until next year. And I'm home. And I don't like not having the structure, but okay, I'm here. And right. really was very um, owning it and just yeah. kind of trying to embrace it. Um, Eddie, I'm going to put you on hold because I want to bring you back at the end of the show so that we can talk amongst the three of us, if that's okay. Lovely. And I, I, I can't wait to see what Levi has to say. He's going to be uh, like, oh, that guy shut up already. I'm I know, I know. I realize we went a little long, but I see him at his keyboard. He looks like he's ready to join us. So uh, I'll be back to you in a bit. All right. Thanks, honey. Um, uh, My next guest, I have to say, I knew him when, like, I didn't even know who he was. This is how I knew him, and yet I didn't know him. I was hosting L.A. Pride. I want to say it was 2007. He can correct me if I'm wrong, and he will. And uh, very good-looking singer-songwriter, pleasant, incredibly pleasant backstage to the point that um, he stayed with us backstage and just was kind of talking and helping and what do you need, and um, it struck in my stuck in my head as... What a great person he was. Three years later, um, this happened. 
The American Theatre Wing's Tony Award goes to Levi Christ, Million Dollar Quartet. With his Broadway debut, Levi Christ wins the Tony. In addition to acting in Million Dollar Quartet, he also contributed some of the arrangements. Thank you. I just, I don't think an outstanding performance can exist authentically without a team that is working as a whole and as a unit in harmony. And I have, I owe this to the, to the best, most talented, supportive cast uh, and crew that, that I've ever had the privilege of working with. I also want to thank uh, my spiritual community, Bodhi Spiritual Center in Chicago, uh, Reverend D and Reverend James Mellon for holding me up and making me more available to my good. And uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here. Mom and Dad, thanks for coming tonight. I'm glad you did. <laughs> thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. If you think that that guy is too good to be true, you're mistaken because he is everything you'd expect him to be, Levi Christ. Oh my gosh, what an intro. <sighs> Sweetie, how are you? That is so sweet. Billy, it's so great to see you. It's been a long time. It's been really long. And can I just say that I'm looking at the screen behind you? My mother has the same screen downstairs <laughs> in the living room. Oh, you know, yeah. if if you, it, I could run downstairs and bring it up here. My mother <laughs> loves stuff like that. Yeah. I, of course, uh, we're, but, we're doing live stream concerts here, and, and so the background keeps changing as as uh, I decide to do projects around the house. <laughs> so. um, I, I think that really, from when you appeared on LA Pride, and I'm going to show a clip in a minute, but um, from that to Million Dollar Quartet yeah. was only three years, and it yet was. it's an extraordinary journey to have come. You know, first off, let me. I would like to point out, and this is no disrespect to you, you were not a headliner at. LA Pride. Uh, oh. You weren't even in prime time. I didn't get to introduce you. Yeah. I was coming on after you. You were one of the afternoon performers, which yeah. we use for up and coming performers yeah. because we want to give them a platform. But to go from that to A, Broadway, and B, winning a Tony is yeah. just, that's got to be mind blowing for you. Oh, listen, there's so much more to that story, though, too, because Please. Truthfully, my Broadway debut. I believed was going to be a musical that I had workshopped all the way from Issaquah, Washington at Village Theater to the Kennedy Center, mm -hmm. uh, North Shore Music Theater in 2001. It was a gorgeous musical uh, written and directed by Emmy Award winner Paris Barclay. What uh, was it? Five guys in their one year tour of duty in Vietnam. It was called oh, One wow. Flower Letters from, Viet Letters from Nam. Mm -hmm. All of those things that we spoke and we sang. Uh, were actual letters written from these soldiers wow. from Vietnam home. And for me, who I, 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 got into, I started studying acting in 1999, 1998. And for me, this was the role of a lifetime. There was so much depth. And, and we were lined up for a theater on Broadway. This was going to be all of our Broadway debut. Mm -hmm. And then 9-11 happened. Oh, yeah. And the producers couldn't get comfortable with the concept of bringing something like that to Broadway. So when I right. went back to LA after, after feeling like all that work, see, I love workshops and, and, and mm -hmm. so much of my time is into new works because it is so interesting for me to find those perfect roles that, that, uh, that challenge me as an actor, but also fit me in a really unique way. Like, like Jerry Lee Lewis did, you know, I mean, right. I, use something that was so unique to me to bring that role to life. So, And when I mean, you do a new role in a workshop for people who don't know, you are usually afforded a lot more time to find that character and you are creating it. You don't have somebody else's performance to base it on. You really get to find your way if I you have a good director. I love yeah. that though, because in right. my master classes at, um, uh, with theater students, I, I try to tell them what makes them unique makes them a commodity. And if they're mm -hmm. are willing to lean into what makes them different, they're probably going to find their sweet spot in the industry. And I find, by the way, this conversation was so interesting with you and Eddie because it, 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 it's, so, it's just such a rich look at the industry. And you yeah. can see that like for sometimes the roles that actors get known for, there's roles behind the scenes, whether workshopped or maybe something obscure, that was an entirely different side of that actor that mm -hmm. the world by and large may not have an opportunity to see, but then had you seen it, you would have had an entirely different interpretation of who that And it may was. inform their later work. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, stuff. Somebody yeah. said to me recently, and um, I, there is a chapter of your life that I'm missing, and I should have been more aware of it because I lived in LA and it uh, surrounded a lot of people I knew, yeah. which was your collaborations with Del Shores. Oh, and yeah. uh, and somebody, you know, I knew obviously that you had worked with them and you know appeared with them. I did not. Somebody said to me that Del Shores in many ways gave you the platform mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of work that came after the fact. So I, I've heard I've heard parts of this story from someone else. How did you meet? Well, for, first of all, I got to say Del, Del Shores and Leslie Jordan are, are, are like the two people that took me under my wing immediately coming from Tennessee, Oliver Springs, Tennessee, graduating class of five people. <laughs> Victoria with a C average. <laughs> so you were the average student amongst five. Right. right. <laughs> but, uh, I was walking down Melrose Avenue one day and, and some of my friends that are also from Tennessee and from Georgia looked up and saw this image of this guy wearing nothing but, you know, little skivvies and his arms outstretched at the Zephyr Theater. And it was the it was the it was the uh, the, the the billboard for Southern Baptist Sissies, which is a show mm -hmm. that Shores did. Right. Um, and so they said, well, why don't we come in? Why don't we come in and watch it? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I don't know. And I was a little nervous about it because first I had not really come out professionally at that point. I had come, I had been outed to my Southern Baptist college after six years of conversion therapy. And then that wow. guy going to a record label, I had just signed and outing me to the record label and dropping me from the record label. I'm writing a book. Um, good, good. <laughs> but, uh, but I went in that day and I realized like, and I saw the story of these four guys dealing with, in very different ways, this collision of religion versus sexuality. And all of a sudden I realized I wasn't alone. And I, by, by, by intermission, I was in a fetal position, crying my eyes out. And this gentleman taps me on the shoulder and says, son, are you okay? Do you need some help? And I said, do you like this thing? And he goes, well, I wrote it. <laughs> and it was Dale. So wow. From that moment on, I, I, I talked to him at length about how it impacted me. He invited me back to see it. I think I saw it for free like 36 times until I finally was inspired to write the song Stained Glass Window, which uh, became the theme song for Southern Baptist Sissies, the theme mm -hmm. song for the motion picture, and is probably one of my best known songs now. So. And you performed it quite a bit at the Zephyr Theater, according to friends I saw. They saw you at the end of the show would perform this. Is that true? Yes, yes, yes. And we even went on the road with it, with uh, Delta Burke. And we traveled the country doing uh, doing Southern Baptist Sissies. And I believe it was Trailer Trash Housewives was like a like a duel. Like in rep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, it's interesting, and I think it's important for people who watch this who want to be performers to realize that uh, you can plan sort of a route of how you're going to go, but your opportunities can come from the least expected places. Yeah, because yeah. after that, you did find your way back to um, recording and performing as a singer songwriter did was that sort of a detour for you did you want to go back into theater did you have a plan at that point well um, i fell in love with theater the moment i did a cattle call for the broadway national tour of rent and got the role of roger in 1998 mm -hmm. And I immediately came back home and said, okay, I have natural instincts. I understand how to create a character, but I have to have the training. So I immersed myself uh, and never stopped since and still have the same, the same wonderful teacher uh, sitting beside Amy Adams and Ryan Reynolds in my class. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was so much fun. And, and, and uh, from that moment on though, musical theater was, was always been a part of my life. And I invested a lot of time into One Red Flower. And it was the producers of that show that found Million Dollar Quartet. And oh, really? So when they got that script, they said, hey, we love what you do with Southern characters. Can you play the piano? <laughs> well, little <laughs> did they know. So yeah, right. So and and then I just I never I never uh, auditioned for that for that role again after workshopping for it, and and I helped arrange a lot of the music for it. And of course, that was one of the things I liked about the Tony Awards when you were walking up to the stage and they acknowledged that you were one of the musical arrangers for the show. Yeah. And I think that um oh god, there's so I have ten million questions. Um, I've seen you play. 
yes. and sing. But I, I, as a pianist, as somebody who who understands certainly playing the piano more than singing, yeah. I have seen you play and I've seen your technique and I watch fingers very often. I watch right. um, position, wrist position in particular. Yeah. Jerry Lee Lewis's playing is much more instinctive and less polished than as you play. And um, sure. I think that uh, I, I do have a clip that's kind of exemplifies this. So take okay. a look at this, which I think had to have been a high point of your life. So okay. look at this. That's Levi over his shoulder. Gosh, I um, haven't seen that, Billy. Oh well, there's so, there's so many things to bring up. Uh, one of the first things I notice, a, as somebody who has idols and respects them, is number one the enthusiasm you have watching him because you're watching an idol and it's like you it, you couldn't have been happier if you were yeah. playing yeah and then i could see you're dying to play with him because I'm, i would play on stage with jerry louis Lew, jerry lee lewis you yeah. wait until he looks over to you and very gingerly stop playing with the left hand yeah. once he starts playing you take your hands off and he needs to tell yeah. you keep playing yeah and so I, 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 I'm projecting a lot, but I, are those the things that are going through your yes, head during yes, this? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Because I, I, you know, play Great Balls of Fire was a family reunion party trick for me at 12 years old. And I think what wow. that makes him and the Rockabilly world such a big deal for me is because Brenda Lee is a family friend. And so oh, wow. I out musical. Um, she had me on her tour bus for uh, a couple of tours, watching her on stage and off. She is a class act. And Brenda introduced me to so much uh, of the music that I know now, the Sun Records music, of course, uh, all the, the, the music of Lieber and Stoller. Uh, when, when I did the, the musical Smokey Joe's Cafe, it was right. everything that Brenda Lee taught me when I was a toe-headed kid. You know, right. so so like that is that is special to me. That's a, that's a genre and a community that is so much a part of my DNA that I couldn't help but be in awe of that, of that moment. And we got to do a duet for his album Last Man Standing too. Oh wow! Yeah. So were were you were you trained as a pianist, or did yeah. you pick it up by ear or or a mix? Well, well what, I mean, I did have a full scholarship for classical piano at Vanderbilt University. So all right, I, so you were trained as a classical trained, pianist. But what you see from from that is is instinctually more of my culture and my upbringing, right? Uh, that I got to use. So is that influenced by my technique? Certainly, that's probably why I can get through developing a show like that for since 2004 to 2010 we were developing that show sure. um, without hurting my hands because i know how to manage but but uh but but yeah a lot of that was just what i grew up with just just sort See, of like and, and just to explain to people how hard that is i was a i was a classically trained pianist and one of my best friends is jennifer lewis and i will approach her songs as a classical pianist she's like could you just play it a little bit blacker? Could you yeah. play it more R&B? And yeah. that isn't yeah. in my fingers. Yeah. If I saw it on written down, perhaps I could do it, but it is not a skill set yeah. I have. And people will say, well, you're a pianist. It, it's not quite that easy. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's definitely, uh, when you grow up in that culture, you know, I grew up very much like, um, it's sort of an integrated experience, you know? I mean, one of the, fir the first church I ever sang at was, was uh, the black uh, primitive Baptist church down the street. And oh, wow. the influences that I had growing up are more strongly Southern soul than they are 
anything else. And, and that's why I think I really love, I'll segue into the new album because Please. I finally committed to that Southern soul that I grew up with, with this new album. And I've been kind of hopped all over the place but, um, in the last 10 albums, but it's so nice to land at home with a, with a music that I understand more than anything and know that I can spend the next 20 years there. It'll age very nicely. Um, and, and let's just show the album. This is the new album. Yeah. Bad habit. Bad habit. Now, you know, do you have to cover half the face? Really? <laughs> Let them see the face. Although they get to see the arms, which I guess are okay too. <laughs> um, but um, it seems to me, I was listening to this last night, you and I had uh, texted back and forth and I had already downloaded it. And it seems to me a very personal album, much more than your other work. Although again, your other works seem more a uh, singer songwriter as well, but there's a depth to these lyrics in particular. Thank you. Um, you know, this is this was uh, four years in the making, and I'm still writing songs to complement this. I'm, these will join. This is an EP, album. right? Yeah, this is just the first five songs of what's right. been being a full length album. But it's information for me to go ahead and release it now and see kind of what people are relating to. And the thing I love the most about this, this is the first time I've really tried to have a lot of fun on songs like Three Words, the cover of uh, the George Michael song Fate. Freedom. Oh, faith, right? Uh, uh, which was a, a hoot to do. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, the, the most personal aspect, the most personal thing about it is I talk about um, the the struggle of sobriety. I'm 11 years sober. I had oh, some huh. serious drug issues about the time I was seeing you in 2007 <laughs> <laughs> uh, around LA, and so it's been really nice to kind of like. I wanted to write about what it feels like to be in that moment of indecision where you honestly don't know whether you're going to fuck it up or not, or whether you're sure. going to be able to make a decision that is more along the lines of learning how to love yourself. And that's, that's, that's one song I wanted to, to kind of encapsulize that with the song Bad Habit. Um, I just want, since we mentioned LA Pride, I want to show a clip from LA Pride. I mean, now that you've talked about kind of where you were at that point, uh, you'll tell me after watching this, is this a uh, happy memory or a painful? Am I looking at somebody maybe in pain and struggle? Because I hadn't thought to think of it that way. So let's look at this for a second. And note what you say at the very. You know, there is an exuberance to that performance. And I, I was struck by the I'm home, which yeah. seems to me just comes out of the moment and really uh, sincere. Uh, how does how does that how does when you look at that, what do you see? I had I see a moment of breath after what was two years of everything blowing up for me. Because really? I had come off of my eighth major record label, which it was another story about why they couldn't market me because I was openly gay, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the reasons I'm writing this book because of everything from the conversion therapy to the gay bashing in Hamilton Park, New Jersey, to all the labels who wouldn't employ me because of being gay, to the thing that happened at college, outing me and dismissing me from my classes because of being gay, everything that has occurred. And then all of a sudden I get this call to audition for The Apprentice. And wow. they were doing an episode where they were taking an unsigned artist and they were going to, to pr uh, write a song, record it, package it and produce it and present it to XM Radio. And the, long st the, the short of the story is they chose me, we did it, my team won. And the, res the uh, result of that was that I ended up taking these eight songs that I had written about boys, talked to Del Shores and I said, should I tell them that I'm gay? 
And he says, yes, come out professionally. And the moment I went on the show as myself with these eight songs that Atlantic Records couldn't touch because they were mine, but they were all about boys. Um, immediately, that's when everything blew up for me. Advocate, Out, Genre, um, DNA Magazine, Attitude in the UK. Everything began, like, I finally realized that I had my tribe, you know, that, that, that right. like, my experiences were shared by so many of us. And it put me in a position where I got to be one of the pioneers of that that new out music movement with Ari Gold and, and Eric Hyman and all of us who were touring and touring and touring. So I had just from before that performance, I just got off the road from a from a tour sponsored by gay.com and we hit like 65 cities in 67 days or something like that. And it was insane. And I was in love and I was also an absolute mess, <laughs> but at the same time, it was good being home. Yeah, you're right. It was, it was a moment. Well, you know, I, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate because there's so many ways one can look at it. On one hand, the first thing I thought of was, from going through those struggles and experiences yeah. could have been what led you to a Tony award. Yes. On the other hand, had you not come out and gone through those experiences, you may have had greater success as a pop artist. So do yeah. you think about those, how those choices inform where you end up? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 it is a temptation sometimes to have regret because I do know that had I, not chosen early enough. See, I was driven to be real honest about my sexuality after going through the six years of conversion therapy because I had developed an incredible case of Crohn's disease and my body actually couldn't take being having this secret anymore. Mm -hmm. So had I been able to keep it, like so many other artists that I know that came out after their major success, yeah. would it be different? I think maybe so, but I think that's the same thing. This, that's the same reason why now I still have so much to do and I still have so much faith in being at the top of my game right now and inspired to keep my voice out there, imagining things that I never thought I could, like, I'm not done. And I think right. maybe if everything had happened like the, like the other way, maybe I would be done by now. Maybe I would have already had enough. You know, I, I agree with you. I think that, um, a lot of times we look at people who are famous, say a Ricky Martin, and yeah. say, oh, how brave it is to come out. I don't know how brave it is for somebody who already has everything to come out. I suppose they risk losing it, but there's a shelf life for everybody. Yeah. I think the people who make it on their own, and honestly, I think that's bravery because you are risking potential mm -hmm. versus risking something you already have. You're right. And you know, it's, it's people don't realize that back in the day, I mean, I was on film sets in the two thousands where I know gay entertainment executives would not give a gay person a chance. They did right. not want to cast them. So this whole thing about how all these networks and industry is so supportive of the LGBT community, it's because they realize we have the highest expendable income. And it's because they understand the money they're missing if they don't. But that didn't happen until, what, 2013, 2014? We're not if really then. to it. Right? Um, and now let's also mention that you are not a bad looking person. <laughs> and uh, uh, you heard me talking, Teddy. We talked about we. I had talked to Thomas Roberts and Steve Kometko on Tuesday about being very good looking and the pros and cons of it. Now, you have not been shy about using your looks for for your expression and to sell. If it gets people to listen to your music, great. Um, we have two album covers. Oh, There's no. one there. <laughs> Sorry, Levi, uh, you put it out there, but that's not even the, that's not even the big one. You know, which one's coming next, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then there's this. <laughs> okay. Now I would buy that CD, even if I were an opera, only an opera fan. Cause I'd say, well, I gotta listen to him. <laughs> um, you know, and there is a, um, a danger of sort of being stuck in the category of somebody who's good looking and that's all they have to offer. Mm -hmm. How has that worked in your career? 
Um, well, the cool thing I get to say is like those examples that you just showed are the only, I think I can say they're the only only examples you could probably even find. Oh, wait, I've got three more. No way. <laughs> <laughs> except for the, except for the rare <laughs> occasional Instagram photo, like that shirtless two days ago, which is all about. Yeah, the exactly. Photo. But, but listen, but I, <laughs> I, I, I've kind of, avo I, I've avoided it more than I have because I've, you know, and, and my first my first album, my debut album, I didn't do anything like that because I I wanted people to hear my my music first. Right. Um. So I have always chosen. I feel like I've always chosen it creatively. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but like oh, you have. the Imagine Paradise album cover. I wanted to make a gesture because that album was a fully kickstarted funded album, and all those names on my body. Uh -huh. are the donors and i wanted to make a point that because of them that they're the only thing that that they're the only thing that uh was the reason that that existed so i didn't want to dress myself up and become levi christ the artist i wanted it to be nothing but them you know and i will say when i saw this it may i really i have to say honestly i did i guess i noticed that somebody is naked but what i really noticed was it made me look closer and say, what is that about? Good. So Good. I, I suppose I did now. The other one looks like a religious interpretation, something yeah. you'd see iconography. And so I get that as well. It's not really flesh for flesh sake, although yeah. it doesn't hurt. It was a button pusher. I wanted people yeah. to, it was a button pusher yeah, for sure. Um, no, and I think that's great. And I, uh, but I will say, even this, I say, oh, this is a good-looking guy. You, you don't miss that, but it's not blatant. It's not pandering in a way. Listen, I, I think that's the sweetest thing for you to say. I realize that that there are a lot of better-looking people in entertainment than myself, so I'll take that completely. Mm -hmm. Well. And, and as I said earlier in the show, uh, when I met you backstage at Pride, now we saw in the video, you're in tight jeans and a tank top. Uh, what I wow. remember yeah. was how nice you were. And that's because in West Hollywood, you've lived in West Hollywood. Yeah. There's a lot of good looking guys. They're kind of disposable. You don't really remember them unless they make an interpersonal impact on you. And you may, and it's funny because when I wrote to you to ask you to be on this show, I came to you as, I don't know if you remember, it's been uh -huh. a long time. And you came back to me with, of course, I remember in like mentioning things. I'm like, oh, yeah. We it was the two sided moment. Yes, it is, and and believe me, it's hard for me to let you interview me when I really want to. <laughs> I, I probably could come up with ten questions right now. I could be asking you. you know? Well, you know, we'll 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 flip it around. We'll flip it around next time. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, um, before I bring Eddie back to us, uh, I want to show this this you know going back to your piano playing and Broadway work. There's two performances that I find interesting to just look at back to back. This is a clip of you in Million Dollar Quartet. So I just want to show this for a moment. Yeah. Nope, that's not the one. You know which one that is. I this do. is you in Million Dollar Quartet. Notice his fingers if you can. Okay, now believe me, people at home watching that, if you're a pianist, you watch that and say, you, to, to those of you, it looks like a lot of slamming around. To those of you who have studied piano, you say, that guy's got a great technique because it is in there 
it it's modified, but the, the when you go to play, the default goes back to position and it's very controlled. It does. It, you know what? I, I didn't think about that until you really mentioned it, but it does. It does. Um, think, listen, it saves my wrists. Well, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and so now here is uh, Levi had gone to Chicago to do a solo concert and Million Dollar Quartet was playing there and he came on stage at the end to sort of jump in with them. He's not playing a role at this point, which I think is uh, there is a differentiation because you'll notice he plays differently. Uh, and of course, it's a different song. I realize that. But anyway, look at this clip. That clip, Jesus, I don't know what clips I'm showing. Let's keep it running. Yeah. Let's take a look at the whole. See my baby, this is this one's done. In the corner when the sun comes out. She bring me coffee in my favorite cup. It's my dough. Now, when you see that, do you feel that you perform differently as Levi versus as Jerry Lee Lewis? Oh, I totally do. I totally do. And because you look, I'm you seem still, to. I, I'm still catering to the environment in that performance. Absolutely. I mean, if if I'm doing my own theater show, I mean, you realize that first of all, the biggest difference is vocally because, you know, especially Crazy. now that I covered life years ago. I mean, you know, I think when you showed me the um the the 2007 uh, Pride, Pride thing, I was smoking a pack and a half a day. So you know, <laughs> I've been clean and sober for 11 years now, even from cigarettes. So like, just vocally, it's a lot more jazz and blues influenced and it, nuanced I, it's much more nuanced um vocally but um there's elements that are still me though yeah because i mean i'm drawing from my roots in a lot of that stuff you know i think that, that that's interesting because i would have guessed that you had a background in that music because even as jerry lee lewis it comes off incredibly authentic right right um so since we have you at the piano yes uh do you want to give us a song uh <laughs> something maybe from something from the uh some the from the ep what, what would you like to do a broadway show so yeah sure give me whatever you want maybe i should i thought about this might be fun i did a um i did an album called broadway the keys where i did my my own versions of these songs, and, and this was this was my favorite Disney movie turned into a Broadway musical. Oh, Eddie will love it. You know it. Baba had to fall in the shadows. Had a thousand tales, Mister Your Bad Luck. Cause up your sleeve, you got a magic that'll never fail. You got some power up in your collar now, some ammunition in your can. You got some punch, possess, a man and how. All you gotta do is rub that lamp and I say, Mr. Bubble, I don't say, what will your pleasure be? I'll never take your order, shut it down. You ain't never heard a friend like me. Life is your friend or a run, and I'm your man with D. Come on, and miss for what it is you want. You ain't never had a friend like me. Yes, we provide our services. You're the king, the boss, the shy. Say what you wish, it's yours to dish. How about a little bag of love? Oh, have some more column A, try all the column B. I'm out of here to do 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 Da, da, da. <laughs> 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 
That was great. Um, can I just ask, I mean, I know I, I keep going, they're going to think this is a, a rude question, but you know, how, what is your hand span? Is it, is it's well over an octave? An octave three. Oh my God. It's only an, I'm only an octave one and one and a half maybe. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm bringing Eddie into our show. Eddie, come on in, honey. Eddie! Hey, I, you know, all I could think as you were playing that was like, oh, I got my three wishes. Aww, <laughs> nice. You guys, your conversation was so, so fun to listen to. Aww, and I've got some book reading to do. I've got some book reading to do. Uh, well, you know, I'm happy to sign your copy. Billy does it, or Billy will sell you one on eBay. Yeah, He's I'll sell you one. Well, yeah. <laughs> I've got, I've got a few. Um, let me ask Eddie, Eddie, you, you know, you talked to Broadway women from musicals, but we have a, a leading man, a Tony winner from Broadway. Is it easier for an openly gay performer? The perception is that an openly gay performer finds a home easier on Broadway. Is that true? Eddie, you go uh, first. Cause I have my opinions. No. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very interested to hear yours. Remember the people that I talked to have already found a home. Um, and most of them are dead. <laughs> well, no, no, I talked to me for this new book. I talked to all of the oh, members right. who are still alive. Um, um, and it was interesting to me to look at the numbers of gay people versus straight. Um, and uh, But the, the, the experiences that they describe, while several of them, like Gavin Creel and Cheyenne Jackson, describe their coming out process and how that affected their art or when they were ready for it. It doesn't seem to have gotten in the way because the talent was so, uh, was there first and foremost. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but did they, did they have to jump through any extra hoops to prove themselves being gay or did they have the same opportunity as straight people? Do you believe? We'll never know, right? Because yeah. because uh, those people came out at an early stage of their career Um uh, so we don't know what their career might have looked like otherwise. Right. What um, about you, yeah, Levi? What do you think? I feel like Gavin came out about the same time that I came out professionally as well. And we've heard of each other and been in the same circles for so many years. Um, but I, I feel like, honestly, it's it's how it's how you read as an actor, I think, in a lot of ways. Because mm -hmm. for some, I, I have been seen for every gay show you can, you know, everything from Queer as Folk to Looking. And I always get cast as the womanizer, the mm -hmm. antagonist, the troublemaker. The, <laughs> but it's, it's usually like a womanizer kind of guy. So like, I just, I just fit into that. I mean, even, even working in Violet with Sutton Foster, that role was- uh, The preacher, the preacher, right? About him, you know? And, right. and like, there's always some sort of, peacocking kind of characteristic for me personally. So I feel like, and if you look at Gavin and you look at um, Cheyenne as well, I mean, I think they just always, the the way they carry themselves, it, it, it kind of allows them to play those roles a little more. I think it's- I don't, I don't want to tell- I don't want to tell somebody else's story, but I'm going to. Um, uh, Christopher Sieber, is he in the book? Yeah. yeah. I love yes. Uh, Christopher Sieber is, uh, we all know him. And um, I when I first with Patty Lapone too, yes, right. When I when I first met Christopher Sieber, um, I met him with Cheryl Lee Ralph, and they had appeared in Thoroughly Modern Millie. And at some point backstage, it came up like that Christopher was gay, and Cheryl Lee Ralph, who you would assume can spot a gay guy a mile away, had no idea, refused to believe it, and he actually made an entrance, gay guy coming through, and just pushed his way through. <laughs> and But he, because of his looks and the way, as you said, that he read, he was so often cast as a leading man. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, I guess, we'll go to the next question, which is... Um, I always felt that Christopher Sieber was a character actor trapped right. in a leading man's body. And as life has evolved and he has grown out of that sort of pigeonhole, his career has exploded. I saw him as Bobby in company. He was fantastic, but he could have been 20 other people. Now he's winning Tony Awards and sought after for these character roles. Yeah. So Levi, you're kind of stuck, right? Stuck. Like it's hard to be stuck when you're Levi, but you are in the leading man category right now. Yeah. Do you feel that that's the category for you? 
I do actually. And, and I just, uh, uh, excited about workshopping a new musical that just came along called Pure Country, where I'm been cast as the lead. I, I we were scheduled to go to first day of rehearsal when COVID happened. But I mean, it's, oh, it's, wow. it's, it's it's always been my dream. I mean, will I not do other interesting, more character actor roles? Yes, of course. I, it's the character you fall in love with. You know, it's not the, mm -hmm. the idea of being a leading man or not or ensemble. Right. Or it's it's do you do you fall in love with that character? Do you want to does he, do you want to breathe life into that? So um, that's what I look at mostly. I mean, yes. It, so you are in the on personally, and I feel yeah. like I can tell it in a way that somebody else can't. Then I I usually have to do it. Yeah, that was actually the question I was getting to, which is, do the roles that you uh, gravitate to, are they the roles that you would be cast in? So many people yeah. say, oh, I want to do this role. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, call us in 20 years. Well, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, I, uh, confession, I didn't love Million Dollar Quartet, especially no. coming off of One Red Flower and coming off of something that had, that was so satisfying as an actor. Book driven. I, I actually was a little bit of a snob about Million Dollar Quartet myself. And like we were going to Chicago to do a, yet another round of it. And I actually had the conversation with my then partner. Maybe I'm not going to do this. Wow. Yeah. So I had no idea that it was going to be what it is. But then again, some of my favorite roles are stuff that I've been workshopping. Like uh, they did a wonderful workshop of Mozart uh, based on the movie Amadeus where I was the mm -hmm. role of Mozart. And uh, then there was this squabble with the book writers and being from France and the writers from here. And it just never went forward. You know, there's always some random reasons why those things, really of good course. pieces don't get seen the light of day. And uh, get Jack recently, where it's based on uh, Jack the Ripper playing the role of Jack. And so oh, that would be very interesting. Uh, that wonderful journey psychologically, it just, it challenges me. It makes me better. It turns me on. And uh some of my favorite stuff that I've done is has has a isn't what isn't the first thing people would think about when they know me, you know. Are you interested in doing roles that uh, are so antithetical to who you are, or do you like to play roles that you can sort of identify with and and are uh, compassionate with, like Jack the Ripper? Yeah, exactly. Very you know, likable person. Well, but, but at the same time, you, you can't. It's probably charming. You have to pr approach him with, with like absolute oh, right, right. understanding, right? You have to believe that there was absolutely a reason for <laughs> Right. I mean, do you have to, do you, do you like sort of that challenge of finding the charm and the nuance in maybe a character that people come in against? I adore the challenge of finding the redeeming quality of people. Mm -hmm. Or irredeemable. That's this is this is the 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 people who like finding those redeeming qualities of people. Eddie and I date. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I mean, oh, that, no. you hear that again and again. That nobody you 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 can't you can't play a character well if you can't find that because because otherwise unless that character is so self loathing that's the only way in. But you know. Right. Ask anyone who played Sweeney Todd, and I've talked to many. Like, eh, you know, if you don't find it, you're you're stuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, do you have a dream role right now that you have your eyes on that you're like, okay, five years, I have to play this role because there are roles that you will age out of, and there has to be some yeah. sort of a short list that you're like, I don't care where it is if it's in a little you know regional theater. I just, just want to do short it. Side, just from my immediate experiences, it would have been Get Jack. I don't know that if that I don't know that that's going to move forward now, but workshopping that three different times, it 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 would have been. Oh, it's just it was just you know. So I, I'm still in mourning, <laughs> <laughs> but um. I'm also trying to focus on writing my own material as well and, and, and working with other writers and, and finding vehicles for me that are going to, to be strong experiences like 10 years down the road. Cause you know, it takes a while sometimes to get everything from conception to stage. With uh, Eddie, when you were talking to the men for the upcoming book, did you find that they had some of these same struggles that Levi's talking about that, you know, there were the dream roles that they got this close to and then for whatever reason they missed out on? Sure. And I mean, it's, you know, it's it's a great party game to imagine 
people in varying roles or if they had gone to different people or you yeah. hear about these people talking about, yeah, I left the audition room and there was thus and so sitting right there. And, you know, um, uh, it's, it's always a, a fantasy story, but of course that's the nature of, of, of the business. And, and it, it, you just never know what, you know, had Could have been. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and what, and if that had happened, then the next thing wouldn't have happened. I mean, you know, one of Cheyenne Jackson's best Broadway performances is Xanadu. And that was only because James Carpinella broke a leg, you know, I mean, you never, ever know. You never know. You just never know. I want the revival of A Boy From Oz. That's what I want. All right. Well, see, now you've put it out there. That's, I think, interesting. Um, You know, when, uh, Eddie, you just mentioned um, Len Carew a bit earlier and w watching Seth's show, which, by the way, is on every day, uh, two o'clock and eight o'clock. Um, he did a Sondheim show with Len Carew and I had no idea. And I think I know everything, but I don't that. Um, Send in the Clowns was originally envisioned for his character to say well, the moment, the, the moment. moment, right. Until it became a song and a speech. And, um, and then he ended up singing the song um, on Seth's show. And I thought to myself, I wonder if a, what it would have done for his career, if anything, and B, if, the song would have become what it became. Sometimes those moments and those performers coincide to create magic. And I think, uh, Levi, you got to do that with playing Jerry Lee Lewis. I mean, that's that's synchronicity. That's what we're talking about, right? When when you do have a moment where the stars kind of align and, and put you in a place at the right time, too, because... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that there was a lot of musicals prior to that point where... Uh, where the entire band is the actual music, where we're all actually the singers. There's no backup musicians. There's mm -hmm. no support track. It's all us. Balls hanging out there. Nothing to support us other than our own musical abilities. Like, I think that was kind of the first... I think that all also contributed to the, uh, you know, the, the, the novelty of that. Experience. And the energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking of the John Doyle examples, which I'm sure Eddie probably was as well, which is a different kind of animal. It's it's a conceit. There are a few yeah. others, like, you know, Pump Boys and Dinettes. And, yes, right. But, 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 yeah, I, yes, I get your point. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think there was also a perception, Levi, that this was just going to be a concert million dollar quartet, yeah. that it was not a full theatrical experience. Did you run up against that? Well, we always pushed for for there to be, you know, we, we needed character arcs. <laughs> we and needed, more of a book, we sure. Story. We really needed to do what we could to develop that story. And, and you know, it got nominated for best book. It was a nominated best book. But but from the beginning of the stages of it, yeah, workshopping it starting in 2004, it was, it. we didn't know whose story it was even at first until we started to really sink our teeth into, this is a journey, you know, and I got to go back and play, um, just here at uh, Del, Del, you know Del Dickey, who's also in mm -hmm. yes. Del Jordan and Leslie Jordan, who was uh -huh. who's uh, uh, won a SAG award for Winter's Bone. She's been on everything from My Name Is Earl to you know she, currently I think she's on a TV show and a beautiful stage actress. She's from Knoxville, Tennessee, so she introduced me to one of the guys there. We did, I, and we, they said, "Do you want to mount this and be Sam Phillips?" And I said, "I'd love to know what that journey is after." <laughs> So we did a little six week run of, of Sam Phillips and, and it just, it, 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 and the only reason I did it was because the director said, I understand that we can get so much more out of this story than what a lot of the, the post Broadway touring companies are, 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 are doing. And so sure. we had so many liberties and we really met, like she treated it like a play and we got, wow. we got a lot out of it. It was a really fun exploration. So yeah, hopefully that translated for for people. I mean, it's not Shakespeare, but at least it was a sweet little story. Well, but I, I you know, I think that I think you know, uh, Eddie and I talked about this uh, several times that when I started doing this show, it is not the show that I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I'm sure when Eddie started his book, it wasn't the book that it turned into. Sometimes you have to be open, and shows and books and plays and yeah. musicals will become the what it's supposed to be. They'll sure. tell you 
they, yeah. they will reveal themselves to you. I, if you're open to it, I think a lot of people fight it. And I, I've gone to shows where the the performances are sometimes fighting the material or fighting the direction. Yeah. And you're like, oh, just let it be what it's supposed to be. Right, right, right. right. Um, we've got we've got uh, some questions. So uh, let me just look. People, get your questions in. Start typing now. Uh, so my friend, oh, one of my best friends, Trevor, said, "So surprising, Levi almost passed on that role." So again, it is. It, it, there's a lot it's of faith involved. By horrible instincts. <laughs> well, there there's a lot of that. I mean, again, as you go through the industry, the the near miss it that the numbers of times that that almost didn't happen and then magic does happen well Eddie, I, will you I, oh, go ahead please. actors want to think with their their actor ego too right and right. we know what turns us on as an actor but that doesn't necessarily mean we're looking through the filter of what is going to be most successful in a corporate theater world right well there's something else too which i think is a testament to what you did in that show the minute that you said you know, you were a bit of a snob about it. I was like, well, then the level of investment that you then put into it, even not be, it's one thing when you're in love with the material, yeah. when you're not in love with the material and you pour yourself in like that, that's work. And that's- And it, eleva it well, sometimes it's, elevates it. I may, I can, it's, it's, it, is, it is my number one passion as a performer, I'll totally get geeky about it. So I'm, uh, but, but the truth is like, I think to go back to, Growing up in the church, you learn to communicate musically through conviction. And, and like I knew that with every role, when you're doing it eight shows a week, if there's a way that you can tie your why into something you want the audience to see that might be healing for them, that might be eye-opening for them, mm -hmm. that might help them just to simply escape, like that's the reason to show up. And, and that is one thing that my stage mother drilled into me, <laughs> right? From the time that she was traipsing me around at 12 years old, making me tour, was have a reason why to show up. It's not mm -hmm. about you, you know? And so I found that, that that story, I mean, playing him wet behind the ears and just this belief in himself, there was a whole backstory of like, well, can I help people watching this to believe unabashedly in whatever it is that they have to offer, you know, just whatever an actor can do to make it, a, to make it a soulful experience, I think is our job, you know. Levi, would, would there have been another role in that show you would have been drawn to, taking out the musical experience character-wise? Because I've always wanted to do sound. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, Eddie, could you tell the Patty Lupone, uh, Eddie, could you tell the Patty Lupone uh, Into the Woods story? Please. Apropos of this point, if you well, remember, it. I'm uh, well, I'm not sure which story. Oh, you're there's so many stories, but the story, there are many. About, the story that she um that she was called to audition for one role and wanted another role. Mm. Do oh, you remember this? Well, <laughs> the, you know there. I mean, th there's there's there there's, several. Yeah. I mean, Isla <laughs> Lapone thought she should have been the baker's wife. That's um, what I'm talking about. That's where and, Cinder and wanted Cinderella at one point as well. And because she thought that, you know, she, uh, she was looking to stretch. She was looking to to do something other than what was expected of her. Um, and mm -hmm. she thought that was uh, the, the, the role with the more interesting arc. Um, and, and I remember her saying, oh, just begging them to let her sing the song, did it. Okay. We still want you for the witch. She's like, but that's obvious. And sometimes right. producers <laughs> want the obvious choice. Yeah. 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 You know, that happened to me with, with uh, the call to do Roger with Brent. And I was oh. so young and wet behind the ears. I didn't realize how inappropriate it was when I got the call to say, oh, well, by now I know the music. And I actually think that I'd be a better mark. And actually mentioned that to them on the phone. I said, no, we're calling you to hire you for Roger. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, but I really like Mark. I think he's more in my range. And I think he's actually, yeah, but, you know, but, but the. I remember uh, in college, oh, I don't even want to say what the play was, but there was a play that I had auditioned for um, that was one role that was who I am. That wasn't the role I wanted. I wanted the other role because sometimes yeah. it's not fun to play the role that's you. You because then you say kind of you're just being yourself. You want to portray a role, and uh, whatever I did, I could not 
get that lead role. And it was the lead. Well, it was a co-lead. Anyway, I didn't get it. I'll tell Eddie about it later. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, Steve Masterson says, uh, Levi, that would be awesome. Peter Allen. So yes. we're putting it out there. Right up my alley. I mean, come on. I love yeah. that. For, that would be the second time that the person who played Peter Allen on Broadway was two feet too tall. Well, right. All right. <laughs> He can do it on his knees. Shut up. Uh, and Peter <laughs> Allen did. Um, oh, did. Awesome. <laughs> oh, can, oh can, Eddie, I don't know if there's a story you can tell. Um, the When Hugh Jackman did the role, um, he had uh, an understudy, and there was uh, it was somebody we know. Uh -huh. Can we say who? That was Kevin Spiritus? Yeah. And um, – but he also was the understudy with kind of a condition that he knew going into the the job. Do you remember what that was? Oh, dear, no. The uh, condition was that he would never get to play the part. Right, right, of course. Yeah. Um, he was basically a standby, not an understudy. Right, but they knew that there was never, you know, he was never going on and that he was there if, if for the last 15 minutes of the show. <laughs> <laughs> he had something off. They needed somebody to step in, but that was going to be it. And uh, I, I wonder, Levi. I, I I know a lot of people, performers who have made a really good living being understudies, being standbys, um, and just sort of giving producers a good, solid backup plan, knowing that they're almost never getting that opportunity. Yeah. Have you been in that position? And how frustrating would that be for you? I have never been in that position. I, I would I would not enjoy it because I <laughs> on stage. I, I just I'm, that's that's what I'm in love with. That's what that's the reason I do it. I mean, you know, I, I gratefully have my music on the side as well, and I always have. So I get to pour myself into that uh, between working on things, and and uh, that's the freedom I get to have having another thing too. You know, is that I get to to choose the things that really get get me excited. Is the solo career more fulfilling in the sense that you get to be the creator, the producer, the director, and it's more of a personal expression? Or is the sort of disappearing in a role and being part of an ensemble? Because having a solo career can be very lonely. Um, or do you not want to make that choice? Yeah, you know, it used to be a lot more personal to me. And and now it's it's uh I enjoy getting lost in a character a lot more than I do now. But I think it's just because, you know, this is, this is just, you know, I think the reason why a lot of people may, you know, th this business belongs to me. I have to promote it. I have to whore it out on social. I have right. to be louder about this because I'm the one who gets this paycheck on my own. And good or bad, it's on your shoulders. Think of my music before they think of my acting because I'm always barking about my music. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't have to do that when someone else has a PR company, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. about their acting. Yeah. So, and so it's it's kind of like a joy to show up and get a, be a work for hire, right? And show mm -hmm. up and do a wonderful job and, and enjoy the people you get to work with because the other is like 80% admin and 20% music. I mean, it's... Right. It's, it's a grind. It's a grind. And, and a hustle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Eddie, yeah. when, when no, you were, when, oh, no, I was ahead. just going to ask, when you were doing the book, either the, the dame, nothing like a dame, got it right here, yeah. going once, going twice. Um, But when you were doing that book or the men book, um, did you find anybody who had as successful a recording and solo career and really was able to balance both? It seemed to be more prevalent in a time where hit songs came out of Broadway shows versus now. There were people. Uh, so there are there are two versions of that story. There's the old time, you know, like the the Ben Vereens and Leslie Uggamses of the world who mm -hmm. started out on Broadway and then were making a ton of money in Vegas and on Atlantic, in Atlantic City and on variety shows. And then there's that whole animal. And then there's the new crop of people like Audra and Brian Stokes Mitchell um, and um, uh, to a lesser extent, but still Sutton Foster who, or Christian Chenoweth certainly, who travel um, and make 
right. or Cheyenne Jackson, who make tons of money doing one nights with um, symphony orchestras. And those, uh, and I don't say that sort of um, uh, capriciously about that money or sort of, they, they they talk about it as it's it's what allows them to then them be careful about the work and to choose to do what they want to do and, and, and yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a it's a different model, but I think that somebody like Audra, even though you know she's a six time Tony Award winner, but she's also got multiple albums and the bulk of her and be, until she was on The Good Fight, the mul the the bulk and of television. Money, now that you bring that right, up, but the bulk of her money was coming from and of her actual living was coming from being on the road. Yeah, and sure. Same and that's that's surprisingly a huge amount of of people in that category. I mean, our, the, yeah. the bulk of their money would come from live appearances. I find more and more each year that like it's 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 very common. I'm finding. Yeah. What yeah. What about uh, Levi? Uh, straight acting without music, you know, just drama or television. There are so many people who have left Broadway, and I was thinking of Maddie Morrison and Audra Baranski. There's a whole bunch of them who were lured by the opportunities for television, sometimes make, finding it very difficult to make their way back, and some people balancing it quite beautifully. Is that something that you would like to do? Absolutely. Uh, the, all the, the films that I've done has never, I, I didn't have to, be musical for those mm -hmm. um, film and stage though are my only experiences thus far so right. I haven't tv under my belt yet and that's what uh my team and i are focusing on because that's kind of where we all want to end up right now right uh have you done a, just a play without yeah, singing I, 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 there was yes in chicago real interesting play called billy billy where the story act one is a billy guy and a billy girl and uh, and this act two is the same story but with the genders switched so that you what an are, interesting thing your own prejudices against particular genders experiencing a particular thing it was fascinating yeah but i just saw the inheritance by the way right before broadway shut down and i'm telling you guys i was sobbing like talk about any actor i told all of my actor friends i said you have to catch this before we go because that is the that for me is the single most inspiring moment as an actor to see what they've done with that. Play. That show, I saw it. You to see it? Five times. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. I was obsessed, but I will say, and forgive the blatant self-promotion, the first time I saw it was at the Young Vic in London. And oh. in the second half of it, at one point, the characters, and you know that there is no set and vir virtually very few props, but at one point, they hold up this in the play. And I literally gasped out loud because I'm in London at this small theater. I'm like, hold up, did that book end up on that stage? Oh, Took me cool. out, but it was, it was crazy. So I actually, I felt because I thought that that show was so, so, so incredible. Um, I felt really like it was a, a gift from the universe to be connected to it in one teeny little way. That's so cool. That's and I'll, I'll also mention somebody watching the show, Richard J. Alexander was watching earlier and commented. And um, I was supposed to see the show twice. Eddie knows because I was supposed to go to London once we were going to see it together and um, didn't. And then we're supposed to see it on Broadway and didn't. And I was coming up to Boston to have my surgery, which was the last week of the show. And Richard J was like, you have to go up and see the show. I will pay for your ticket. You just have to go because you need that as part of your experience, even though it's closing. And, uh, and, and of course I wasn't able to, and, and then we were, it was it go, where was it going, Eddie? It's coming to the Geffen. The Geffen, uh, right. I mean, we're back on track, but but there was something, I mean, we'll see. The, the writing itself is fantastic, but that Stephen Daldry production with that cast was, uh, you know, I you, but again, you you talked before about, about, you said it was synergy. I was thinking alchemy, when all of the things come together in perfection. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that production. That. That's yeah, that. yeah. Well, I think it's both because I think there is the synergy of the chemistry of people, but there's also the feeding off of each other, which again you cannot plan. Right. And um, and you know, I've got a wrap, but I just I it kind of brings us back to this because I think 
Eddie and I had been talking yesterday, and Eddie Eddie is kind of a last minute addition to this group, and uh, but but apparently not. Uh, replacing whom I thought he was replacing, but um, he um, was the perfect person for this show because I really like, you know, what I find when this show works, uh, which is not always the case, but when it works, people feel like they're eavesdropping on the conversation we would be having sitting in a cocktail lounge. Maybe uh, Levi might not be drinking at the time, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is the conversation I would want to have with both of you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, yeah, I, I, I cannot thank you enough. I feel like we could kind of keep going, you know. Oh, I think so. Um, and I think I think we will. We'll uh, we'll definitely do this again. Yeah. But Levi, wait, let me just uh, end with what do you have coming up? Because things are so up in the air right now. Is there anything on the horizon set, or is it just all up in the air? For for acting. Who knows what's happening at the time? Right. I was lined up with with two jobs this year that was going to be my best job since in the last four years, and I was so oh, excited. Oh God! That. And and watched them go by the wayside. Killed me. I mean, and so I'm. Are just, they done? Done or just postponed? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't gotten any word yet. Um, so I'm, I'm in waiting mode. I don't know that any of us knows what the future of these shows are going to be. Right Where now. are you, Levi, by the way? Where are you oh, quarantining? See, to, to self-quarantine. <laughs> and Eddie, you're obviously in L.A. The good thing about a writer is you are able to work during this. Um, this is Eddie's book, Nothing Like a Dame. Uh, what is the next book going to be called, Eddie? I'm keeping with the South Pacific theme. It's called The Wonderful Guy. Oh, oh well, yeah. there you go. Yeah, and uh, when you get to uh, supporting actors, I think uh, Levi's already got the Tony, so you know, just consider him for that book. You know, we can just replace him for a second with there's the book, right? Well, you you want to put Levi in the Patty Lapone slot? Can he just you know, sort of? No, I think he might be more of a Karen Ziemba, <laughs> I believe. I and and I say that knowing most people don't know my opinions of Karen Ziemba, although you do. Um, I have nothing against her. She's a lovely person. She is a truly lovely person. You know, you can say it as many times as you want. Um, <laughs> Levi, I want to thank you, Levi, for doing this. This was so much fun. Thank you for performing. Thank you for playing. I'm with both of you. Eddie, it was fun listening to you, your conversation uh, at the start. Very interesting. I think I have to get a book. Oh, thank you. And likewise, Eddie will send you a copy. Send him one of mine. Send it for free. I'll pay for it. Okay. I'll really connect you to it. Way, it's great to reconnect with you. You know, can I just say that you are as lovely now as I remember you? And uh, I'm, I, there are very few people who I meet in passing, but keep tabs on. And people would constantly come up to me telling me what you were doing. And as I said, and I, I truly mean this, to have seen in such a short period of time, you go from LA Pride to winning a Tony Award filled me with such joy for you because I know what that must have felt like. And it's not an easy journey you've gone on. So I uh, I wish you all the best. I really do. Thank you. And Eddie, of course, I adore you. You know, this also proves to people we aren't the same person. Yeah, um, you know, Richard J. I saw. He said he, we look like brothers, and I, I, I never see it. But okay, okay. No, I, and I will uh, hold on. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Oh my God, you look like brothers. I don't know exactly where this puts Levi and our younger brother. Are they talking about you and I, Billy? No, he's looking about me and Eddie. Oh, and I will say that uh, Robert Robert L had written me last night saying, "Oh." Finally, my dream come true. You and Eddie, he's been campaigning for us to take over a certain channel on Sirius XM. And they're not they are not interested in us. Um, they are lost. I would vote. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Levi. Uh, both of you, please take care and we'll have you back really soon. Actually, stay there, stay there as I wrap the show. Stay there and I'll just come back to you. We'll chat off the air. Uh, thank you again for my guests, Levi Christ, uh, Eddie Shapiro. I am, of course, Billy Masters. I want to thank you all for watching. Oh, God. Next week, as I said, we may have a really great show on Tuesday. may not be a great show. You never know. Um, Thursday, our Dragapalooza Pride Month continues. Note that everybody I've had on this month has been openly gay. 
Just think about that. We will see you next week. Please be safe. Wear your masks. And just remember, if we're here, we're live. Bye-bye, guys.